Well, ladies, welcome to my show. Welcome to the Clear Birth Podcast. It's so great to have you both on. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Great. So when I, I usually just jump right into the questions. and But before I jump into the questions, I just want to ask both of you, how are you holding up during this pandemic? I feel like... Yeah. <laughs> Laurel? <laughs> I feel like now that's just like such a it's a great question yeah. but it's also such like a heavy question because yeah. your mind is just like how am I yeah how am I holding yeah. up um I've really been handling that like by a day by day mm -hmm. analysis today it's a good day yeah I'm feeling good today yeah I'm good today good <laughs> <laughs> Danny how are you doing um, I am tired. Yeah. It is, um, I'm tired of all the things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like I to call this dishes. state. Yeah. yeah. I'm tired of <laughs> so much grocery shopping. <laughs> Even if it's just ordering it online, it feels like a daunting task to yeah. go through like, Will they eat it all in five days? <laughs> Did I get enough? Am I doing this again in a couple of days? Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yes. yes. Yeah, I yeah. totally it's understand. It's a lot. And it's not just like the household things. It's just, you know, managing your space, your time, finding myself being very succinct about time mm -hmm. management. Mm -hmm. And when new things pop up, trying to make myself not freak out like <laughs> because where am I going to put it yeah. so yeah that's where I'm at okay I'm tired <laughs> well, thanks for checking in because I I totally feel that as well I mean I've I've deemed this part of the pandemic like pandemic fatigue and that's kind of where I am I'm I, there are days I wake up and I'm just like yes I can seize the day and then it's five o'clock and I did one thing so <laughs> you know I'm totally there with you <laughs> so Laurel, the first question that I like to ask is what career did you want to do when you were in grade school, high school, and college? Yeah. Grade school, I I actually really like this question. The evolution, right? Yeah. Um <laughs> grade school, I wanted to be a chef. Like mm -hmm. had my mind said that I was gonna be a chef. Um I watched every cooking show imaginable. Like my parents had gotten me all set up to like take courses and do all these things. And then they started asking me to cook for them. And I was like, no. <laughs> the reality I didn't was realize, like, yes. right. That like mm -hmm. you had to do work, to, to do work. So that, that uh, we ended that dream, but I was really set on being a chef in grad school. Um, and then high school, I wanted to be a journalist. Um, mm -hmm. my, da my dad does broadcasting um, journalism and I was like obsessed with that and um, really thought that was gonna be like my calling. I also thought I was gonna go in like broadcast journaling specific like for sports and um, really thought that that would be my, my my dream job yeah. um and then i got to college and had like where i went to school you kind of made your own path there wasn't like a set place you went mm -hmm. like a set degree that you got okay. and i started taking those english courses and again I was like <laughs> maybe not <laughs> so that shifted really got into psychology really got into teaching um, and then in, in college, I wanted to go into special education. Um, so that's like where everything took off. And yeah, that's that's, that's the evolution of, of careers. Evolution. <laughs> Danny, how about you? What's your evolution? Well, in grade school, I was one of those kids that I want to be a doctor, right? And so it was one of those things like that's what smart kids did they wanted to be doctors and lawyers right because we're the Cosby's yes so, yes exactly the hospitals, rather <laughs> so, um, and then um, as I got into high school 
it became more of like, what kind of doctor do I want to be? And it was more of like, okay, I want to be a psychologist. And so I followed that through into college, still wanting to be a psychologist, Mm -hmm. Um, but then changed my major because that's what you do. And um, actually went on to want to be a history teacher Mm -hmm. and very interesting that here we are podcasters Podcasters. (laughs) exactly exactly so tell me a little bit about that trajectory like okay so right before becoming podcasters how did you guys get into doula work so Danny if you want to start this round oh sure um I had taken a pause from working when I had my first child and after my second pregnancy I felt really empowered and felt like I had this whole new skill set and I wanted to share it um, with other women so that they would have first or second or third birth or beyond birth experiences that were um, self-empowering, full of knowledge and not just of the body, but their body specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I started taking the trainings and asking people to show up at their births with them. (laughs) practicing on them so that's basically how I got here um and then I don't know if we want to collide the two and Laurel can go ahead and tell how she became a doula yeah it's kind of the same um my first birth was amazing and I just I I left that birth with so much joy and just like wanted to share so much about it um and I had wanted a doula while I was for that for that birth but Mm -hmm. it just you know I had a pretty solid birth team and it it wasn't in the budget at that time um and then when I was like sharing my experience with everyone they were like well why don't you become a doula like why don't you kind of all the things you did why don't you help other people kind of find that pathway and I was like okay (laughs) sure let me sign up for this training (laughs) (laughs) and signed up for the training and absolutely fell in love with um, being able to share that sacred space with people Mm -hmm. and also, um, you know, being able to show people that there was another another side of birth, of what birth could be. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And now you're podcaster. So how did the podcasting intersect with doula work? (laughs) Um, It's so um, I had just moved back to Columbus. Um, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, moved back. And at that time, I would say like there wasn't, um, I mean, like the birth community is always really small. I feel like everybody always knows everybody, Mm -hmm. but um, where we were, there weren't, I didn't know of many um, women of color who were, or people of color who were doulas. And so I got connected to Danny. um, And then we started like talking through Facebook Um, and just chatting about like our experiences and wanting to meet and all that. And then we actually ended up meeting at a baby expo. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to be best friends with this person. Um, (laughs) Isn't it great when you just click like that with someone? Yeah, and and it honestly, like, like, we didn't even talk that long, but I was like, this person, yes. got me we're yeah, here that, that's exactly <laughs> my tribe my people yes right I love it um and then we ended up taking a training specifically for um doulas of color it was a doulas of color training specifically for people of color and at that training um everyone was like sharing bits and pieces of their birth story like mm-hmm. anytime a topic would come up you would have someone being like well that happened to me too or this is what happened to me or just and to the point where like it it the trainer at some points was like losing the training because yeah. people were just sharing so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was during a, a break, Danny and I were talking and we both were like, people need a space to share. Yeah, We need a space to share these stories. And I mean, podcasting was kind of new at that time, but we knew that that was maybe like the route. So we both were like, we should start a podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Next day, Googled some things. Um, and kind of just took off from there. (laughs) So the both of you started a podcast out of your homes or you went to a studio? Well, yeah, luckily my, because my dad does broadcasting journalism, he did have like someone, a sound engineer and like a studio that we were like using um, and really helped us kind of get things off the ground. 
we reached out to some friends like, hey, would you like to share your birth story? Would you like to be the first people? And of course, like we had Danny share hers first to kind of be the introduction. And Uh then it kind of was like, there were a couple that were definitely our friends. And then we actually started getting submissions from people. And we were like, wow, okay. Yes, this is working. Yeah. Yeah. So Danny, tell me, how was that first that first podcast for you? It was freeing to be able to share the story in a space where you didn't feel like you were, had to say the right things Mm -hmm. or had to, you know, be a perfect story or something that people would be like, oh, this is amazing. Or, you know what I mean? It was like, it was just my story. And especially since it was that first birth that kind of the first and second birth that kind of kicked off my desire to be a doula um but it was kind of nerve-wracking like are people gonna listen to this yeah. are they gonna yeah. like listening to your own voice the first time is mm-hmm. like do I sound like that <laughs> <laughs> it, yes that is that is nerve-wracking hearing your it voice for the first the time it's the craziest part to me and then even just recently, I just told myself, it's not actually how I sound. It's how other people think I sound, yes. right? Because the way you hear yourself yes. internally is yes. different. It's different. <laughs> exactly. My voice sounds nothing like this. And anytime my mother or my niece hear my podcast, they're always like, why does your voice sound like that? And I was like, what's like that? I don't understand. <laughs> like what? Like, I'm just talking. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. And so when people started submitting, people started submitting stories and, you know, as doulas doing this work and being involved in birth, um, we do take a lot in. And I can only imagine hearing these stories, you know, as 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 doulas. I know for me, I plug in, you know, oh, this happened and that happened and this happened. And it is a lot to take it in. How, ha- how do you manage, you know, not getting overwhelmed by just hearing these stories? And, and your format for your podcast, which is really great, is just you let people tell their stories. You don't ask questions. You don't guide. You just give them the space to tell it however it comes out. How, how do you manage processing all of these stories? I think part of it is just what you said, that listening piece. And like, you are at first when people are saying things, you're like, you know exactly what happened in the birth, right? Because you've been in birth and you're like, oh gosh. And it is a bit of the biting of the tongue. It's not correcting people on how they pronounce something Mm -hmm. or if it was true or not. Like, because who am I? I'm the listener. And so that's one thing also remembering, just like we do in birth work, like this was not my birth. Yeah. So it it transfers to us in this, like, this is not my story. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we can kind of hold ourselves to that, it it maintains the integrity of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Not feeling like we have to jump in with everything. We might ask someone to expand upon something um, if they're willing or if they're in a space to do so. But I think that's been the best thing for me is just treating it like like a birth. Like if I was their doula, I know that this is not my birth, so mm-hmm. it's not my story as well. Yeah. yeah. And how about for you, Laurel? I would say the same exact thing. Um, we definitely treat that space the same as if we were present at that person's birth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we are there to kind of be a bridge and guide and allow them the space to share in however way they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and just listening, I think you're able to, in the moment, process it better because you are, you're just listening, listening, um, and letting it unfold however it needs to unfold. So we even had a story once that was shared and I can recall myself like feeling everything about it. And Mm. I was just angry. (laughs) And so, and that is all I said to the the storyteller, like, I feel really angry right now. And so I'm just going to leave that. Right. And I'm not going to keep trying to create more of a conversation around how I was feeling because, Mm of where it left me. And I think Laurel kind of took over more um, until we got to that next part of the story because it was how I felt and I didn't want to keep that into the story. It was just like, okay, this is heavy and I've got to just let, hold that space for myself here in this corner while she keeps <laughs> telling her story. And after we get off this call, I'm going to write how angry I am <laughs> and why I'm angry. 
and what was his name? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that. I love that we have each other too yes. to be able to do that. And I think Danny yeah. and I have a really good relationship where we're able to pick up on where the other person might be. Yeah. Um, like I knew, okay, I'm okay. So let me continue in this moment. And Danny has definitely done the same for me. And I think it does allow us to kind of duel at each other yeah, through throughout the our own yeah. processing through that. And then of course, like after each episode, we'll talk to each other and kind of share our own thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Yeah. I, I, I initially, when I started a pod podcasting, I was going to start one with my niece and it was more of a, of a pop culture kind of thing and that didn't work out because it was like I was like I'm let's plan and you know let's have an idea and she's like let's wing it and I'm like that's not that's not how podcasting goes it's like you just don't show up and just decide to wing it so I was like that's not gonna work so I let that go and then I started I tried with another doula who was um my mentee and um, at, and then went on into her own practice. And I was like, we were going to do this together because we were also going to start another program together and um, a doula program together. And she she was like the, of the same mindset of like, yeah, let's, you know, let's just sit down and have two people talking. And I was like, I don't want to hear that. And I know if I don't want to hear that, other people don't want to hear that. Like we have no rhyme or reason and we're just going to talk. So it's so great that you guys have each other and that you're on the same page with with this and and yeah that's that real that makes things a lot easier so we definitely yin and yang yeah so. yeah <laughs> yep that's type good. a and yeah. that's <laughs> balance yes. it is a true balance for sure like they're definitely we are yes it's perfect great <laughs> so Okay, you told us about a challenging story. So what, what was your favorite birth story that you heard on your show? Laurel, do you want to start? I was, you, I, um, I was thinking about this question. Mm -hmm. And this may sound cliche, whatever, but I really don't have a favorite. Okay. I have some that I love listening to because, like, when I think about birth, or how I think I how I think about the way that everyone should feel from their birth, um, I go to those. Those okay. are the ones that I like share out to my my the families I work with mm -hmm. or to other friends and family. But all of them are my favorite for the simple fact that you can just like in each of each every single one, no matter what type of story it is, you can just hear the person's um, joy or relief or healing and mm -hmm. being able to share in that way. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't know, like that's my favorite about every single one of them. Yeah. It's like, I know, and maybe that's because I was there when they were telling the story. Yeah. So maybe I feel that more, but like, I just love that. Yeah. So I don't know if that's just like me being cliche. No, but. no, it, it makes perfect <laughs> sense, right? How about you, Danny? There are so many to choose from, um, <laughs> but I would say the ones that stick out to me the most um, would be like some of the home birth stories because there's a very specific way you have to surrender to knowing that everything that supports you is in your house. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, in a birth, and it's like if there, it's not here, you don't have it. Like. And that's not just like medication or, you know, like epidural or something. It's, you know, this additional medical specialist, right? Like a doctor, there's these, you know, machines and different things. And I think there's this, there's just courage in that, that we don't often hear enough about home birthers. People just think that they're like hippies who run yes. around barefoot and it's not true. Yes. They're women and, and birthing people who have all different types of careers and lifestyles. And they're people that have found community that they can build and have it present for them mm -hmm. in a way that is admirable and for some people probably enviable like people might envy them in yeah. the sense that you have that much love and support around you so yeah, yeah. a lot of those home birth stories like Shay Pounds hers is hilarious but also like she had a home birth 
And then she has to leave and go to the hospital. She finds out her baby's breech. Finds out there's a breach specialist in the hospital that night. Like it was just like this continuous yeah. thing, yeah. but it's still a home birth story to me. Like yeah. the only reason she left was because something, you know, happened in her birth and she still was able to build support as she showed up yeah. <laughs> to the hospital yeah. that people it's it's um you can't even make it up, right? So mm -hmm. Um, that one, I even think of like Tayo, um, mm -hmm. her story was very important to us. Um, she shared her story with her mother. She's a birth worker, um, as well. And, you know, just planning a, a home birth with her family and her friends, you know, pre COVID where, you know, you can have as many people you want it to be there. Um, and I think that that's, those stories really speak to me and I'm not a home birther. So maybe that's why, maybe I envied it, right? <laughs> And I was like, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. I love that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. I had a home birth with my son, but I was a doula for three years before I gave birth to mm -hmm. him. And yeah, I did find that, you know, t in telling those stories, it is challenging. I think now what has come about because of COVID, a lot of people in New York started choosing home birth. And now some practice, there was an article recently in the New York Times, I'm not sure if you saw it, it was a doctor who talked about that we need to stop vilifying home birth as, as providers. And I was just like, yes, because it's really just about choice, right? Like we should all have the choice to give birth however we choose and wherever we choose and not dictated by insurance or any of those policies. But thank you so much for that, ladies. So my next question is, what do you find are the biggest challenges in not podcasting, but in birth work? Laurel, do you want to start? Huh. Managing systems. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I shouldn't say managing systems. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> Working through systems that don't allow choice or don't make choice um, seem like it's an option, mm -hmm. right? Um, and really being able to support your, your families that you work with through that. Um, I know something for me that's been, that was like teetering on before COVID happened, but definitely as COVID happened is like, I'm, I'm a birth worker who will support in all types of births, right? Birth center, home, um, uh, or at a hospital. But I do find that like, I felt myself becoming very anxious about hospital births mm -hmm. because of just how much of a, sometimes it feels like a fight yes. to make sure that families feel supported. Um, and yeah, I feel like that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. Like I've had to do more internal work to make sure that I'm, I'm fully able to support the families that I work with, but it is really hard managing um, or working within hospital systems. Mm -hmm. How about you, Danny? Mm -hmm. I think some of the challenges come around um, making sure the families are fully supportive of your role mm -hmm. um, and understand it. Yeah. That you're not a friend, mm -hmm. you're not um, yeah. a midwife. <laughs> yes. Also that, you know, you're not there to replace anyone. Mm -hmm. And that can be challenging for a lot of, especially female family members or, or close friends to the birthing person. Um, just because we're so relationship and intimate the way that we are, you mm -hmm. know, as sisters and as, you know, friends that we we take one and like, well, who is this shit? And yes. why is she invited yes. to your birth? Yeah. And, I, and I can't come, mm -hmm. right? Or that I, yeah. I can come this far, but I, I thought I was coming with you to the hospital. Yeah. How much did you pay her? You know, like, what is, yes. what is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why so, did you pay her? I would have done so it for free, right? Her? I you had to save that money. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I do have a question that sparked from that. You said, um, Laurel, you said pre-COVID, um, a lot of people were uh, are allowed in. How many people are allowed in to the hospital in Columbus, Ohio? I think 
pre-COVID, it was what, like five? Wow. Maybe. Did I make that number up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it was definitely between like four or five. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. In New, um, yeah. It's not this in New York. It's only two. Mm, it's only wow. two. If you're in a birthing center, you can have more. Um, but then there was one birthing center that we had that they, they had like a family room. So there really wasn't a limit, but then they closed that birthing center. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Five people. Mm -hmm. that's great oh wow yeah. well, thank you for sharing all, all of that my next segment that I go into has to do with inspiration which you know it's har hard to do in the panorama but <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to start off with asking like what's your favorite thing to do for self care Because, let's see Laurel you want to start yeah um, I think that has shifted with COVID mm -hmm. and for me personally, for the better. Um, I think Danny and I actually recently wrote about this, oh. <laughs> but this idea of self care and how really um, for us, our, our mindset around it is more of a self love, like everything yes. should be, should begin there. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that co like um, COVID has really brought that to light for me about yeah. how I love myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so a practice um, that has helped me become more in tune with, with that um, is breath work, something mm -hmm. that I was able to find and um, do more work around has really allowed me to explore self-love for myself. Like it's a, an actual time that I, take out to really be in tune with me mm -hmm. and what that like how are you loving yourself today yes. do you love yourself today what does that look like today um and that breath work is so like it can be me just taking a couple deep breaths before I make the bed yeah. or it could actually be me sitting down to do a full session mm -hmm. um or even sitting with my kids and being mindful of how I'm breathing and they're breathing yeah allows me to kind of tap into a a whole level of like how how am I loving on me yeah. so I love breath work I, I it it's fascinating when you start doing it you start realizing how shallow we breathe right oh or gosh. when you see a newborn <laughs> and how they breathe and you're like yeah we don't we don't we're not belly breathers anymore we breathe no. so shallow and sometimes we're not even really breathing we're like holding our breath and you don't yes. realize it until you start doing that work that's yeah. really, that's a really good self-care, self-love. I like that term. Yeah. How about you, Danny? Well, it looks like we froze. Oh, no. Danny's frozen. Oh, oh yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if she'll, if it, uh, if it'll come back. Yeah. But oh, there you are. I can hear you. You can hear you. Can you hear us, Danny? Oh, yeah, there you I go. Can. Okay. Oh, how about you? What is your self-love practice? My self-love and self-care practice, it, it starts with every day, well, at least Monday through Friday, I have a call on Zoom with a group of friends, um, one of my fans, the people I pledged with, and um, it starts about 3.30 every day, and we, there's about five, five of us, and we actually do a workout or meditation and it started literally as this pandemic um, started we started doing that to connect with each other and it's been the most we've spoken with each other in years but it's been very impactful I know um, I can count on that being that one thing I can do for myself um, every day and that it has a set time which mm -hmm. is important and I kind of work and schedule around it as well and that helps but also a daily bath helps me um, yes. at the end of the day. It helps me like physically cleanse myself for whatever happened today. Mm -hmm. And it's just a deep rest. And a lot of times it's after everyone else is gone to bed. So that's what I do for myself. That's nice. I like that. I, yeah, we did. We've done so much Zooming during this pandemic with just like everyone and par the Zoom parties. And I have to say, D-Nice has saved my life. Uh. <laughs> 
more than <laughs> on more than one yeah. occasion. If it was not for the music, I don't know what I would have done right. to get through this. So and yes, and I love the idea of baths and just connecting with people, especially since we didn't connect. Now it's brought us together in that sense, right? Because Zoom now, there's no excuse. We can we can meet <laughs> and have a conversation. Um, yeah, that's that's wonderful. So what brings you joy? Danny? What brings me joy is being able to spend time with people in the present, um, whether that's the little people that live in my home and my husband, or, you know, carving out that time to go see someone, even if that's like a pre preparation here yeah. during this time now, it's thinking a week or two in advance, like I'm going to, you know, quarantine myself so I can go see my grandma, right? Yeah. Um, so being present with people that are important to me brings me joy for sure. That's nice. Laurel? I would like to add, I would like to say yes, that's what brings me joy. And then add on to that food. Mm. We're back so to if food. I'm yes. able to combine both of those things, yes, yes, it's solid. It's good. I'm yeah. good. Okay. So what's your favorite meal? Oh, or your favorite my thing favorite, to eat. Okay. My favorite thing to eat is macaroni and cheese, like hands down favorite thing to eat. Biggest comfort um, food. My yeah. mom's macaroni and cheese is amazing. But then also my brother and my sister-in-law have this recipe that just touches my soul. So yeah, macaroni yeah. and cheese is everything. To yeah. Me. <laughs> I love macaroni and cheese. I, my um, best friends growing up, her, they're Haitian and her, one of her, one of them, their mother used to make this macaroni and cheese and she finally taught me how to make it. And now I know how to make it. And I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. What's your favorite scent, Laurel? My favorite scent? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a really great question. Um, I would say my favorite scent is lavender like mm -hmm. lavender is you could just smother me in lavender and oh. I would be fine throw me in a lavender field <laughs> let her be okay, okay. <laughs> good to know <laughs> Danny two cents for me um one is newborn baby mm, that um, is a very good look. Uh, right, right yeah right up in there or under the right armpit here. right all in the creases yes, yes. it's brand new human mm -hmm. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and the other one would be bergamot i really love that oh, smell. Yeah. i really I like that I yeah like i'm that like scent. laurel you could just toss it on everything and i just inhale it so. <laughs> yeah that's good those are great scents what's your favorite quote or saying that inspires you danny we'll start with you Hmm. Quote or saying that inspires me. I'm going to pass the ball laughing. Oh about my that. gosh. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. This is the question I needed the answer to. Right. I I had this down <laughs> you do. I'm like, hold on. Hmm. I do have one. Okay. What is it, it's, I can do this. And it was said during a birth by a client where we know as birth doulas, when women usually are working, people usually say, I can't do this. I can't, yes. He said, I can do this. And it carries with me continuously. Mm. So. Mm. That's a good one. <sighs> Y'all. <laughs> I can't. It's like all the quotes go right out your head. The all second, of all of them just go right out. Yeah, them. the second, the and second. Like, yeah. I, hold on. My, my journal is near me. Let's okay. see what we got here. Do I have any written down? This is cheating. Is it? Is it? <laughs> Danny's like, I came up with I it mean, on the cuff. Where's cup. my Maya exactly. Angelou book? Right, oh Maya my Angelou. Gosh. Yes, anything Maya Angelou. Okay, I, I, I am cheating. Okay. But, um, and it's, it's not exactly what this person said. I know that I probably paraphrased when I wrote this down. Um, 
but this is from one of our good friends, Monique uh, McChrystal, and it was during a workshop she put on and she asked the question or something around, where do you find sanctuary in your body? Mm. And that sits with me so heavy and in such a beautiful way. And I don't know if it, does it count as a quote? Is yeah, it a, no, I don't definitely, know. definitely. But it was definitely, where do you find yeah. sanctuary in your body? Yeah, that's a that's a really nice one. That it, it reminds me of um I took a neonatal resuscitation course and the woman who taught it said, you know, everybody gets really excited when it's time to push, right? All the lights come on, all the everyone's like all the energies up here and she's like was very grounding is just say, you know, find my feet on the floor, right? Mm-hmm. And just pull yourself back into yourself and and that reminds me of that like when you start thinking you do the roving body check of like where where's their tension where's there's where's their comfort where there's dis-ease like yeah so that yeah. that does count as a quote definitely okay. yeah <laughs> cheating and all okay, yeah. <laughs> danny's like okay you could cheat all right <laughs> when when the world opens up again what would you hope to see happen with birth stories in color? We want to go on our world tour. We want to go to all the places we have storytellers yes. and meet them in person and meet their children, yes. their families, um, hold space for those who don't have the children that yeah. they spoke of with mm-hmm. us. Um, all of that. That's our, our, our dream. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that idea. I really do. I will be there. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, definitely put that one on. So my next segment is a little bit lighter or not. This is my segment where I ask you guys to share your birth stories, whichever birth story you want to share, however many you want to share. Who'd like to go first? Okay, I'm gonna pick Laurel because Danny Danny was like, you cheated the last time, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can actually I can speak on my daughter's birth since I did since you asked how did this all like how did you know birth work begin for me mm-hmm. and it began with my daughter Naomi, um, and she was I was almost 42 weeks. Mm-hmm. And she was not showing any signs of making her way. Um, and so I, uh, had, I was with midwives, um, but in a hospital. Okay. Um, so, and that was when I was living in D.C. And so, you know, I had, we had done all the natural things to try to get things to come on and just nothing. I was zero, cervix all the way back. Nothing was, was going on. So we scheduled an induction. And I actually, my birth team included my midwives, my mother, my father, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and one of my best friends who was also going to be photographer, taking pictures. Okay. She's a photographer. And so the day of the induction, I spent most of the morning by myself. Um, I took a long shower and just kind of like sat around the house because my parents were driving in um, and my in-laws and my husband were out. Um, oh my gosh, my husband was on my birth team too. I forgot to mention <laughs> Frankie. <laughs> Sorry, implied. Um, he and my in-laws were um, out getting some things ready. And then um, it's funny, my dad and my mom arrived and they're all giddy. And I think none of us knew. I mean, I knew that babies take their time, especially for inductions, but I don't think they all knew uh-huh. what we were in store for. Um, my dad comes in, he's got champagne. He's like, do you want a glass of champagne? I'm like, dad, I'm literally about to go to the hospital. (laughs) Um, but there, you can just tell really excited. Um, they, uh, we all drive together. So my parents, my husband to the hospital, we arrive and they tell us that my bed isn't ready. And that for me, like at that point, I started to feel a little unsettled Mm -hmm. at this whole time. I was feeling like really confident, but the simple fact that they said my bed wasn't ready. I'm a planner. So I was like, y'all told me (laughs) to be here at eight. I'm here at eight. Yeah. What's the issue? So it's fine. Um, 
had to wait about an hour, but we were all in the hallway playing spades, playing cards. Um, I just love looking back on like the pictures that my friend took of us all just in the hallway, kind of hanging out. And then they said the room was ready and we went back and they started hooking me up to the IV. Um, I started off with uh, Cervidil, which with Cervidil, you kind of have to wait Mm -hmm. uh, six hours to kind of see if it does anything. So during that six hours, We were all hanging out Um, as nighttime came. My parents um, went to their hotel. My in-laws were staying at our house with our dog. My best friend went with them. And Frankie and I kind of just hung out through the night. Um, I was trying to do movements to get things on, taking a shower, like just trying to help things progress, hoping that like when they did my next check, I would have progressed. Um, So the next morning, they checked the Cervidil. It had not come out and uh, there was no change. Mm -hmm. So they said our next plan of action was to be on Pitocin. And I freaked out at that moment because I knew that Pitocin can kind of make things a bit more intense. Mm -hmm. And I'm like looking at the midwife and I was like, you're sure there's nothing else? Like there's no other... There's no other option. There's nothing you can like do here. And she was like, no, what? If we're, we need to get things going, we'll start low, you know, we'll, we'll kind of ease our way through it. And she was like, why don't you eat? Um, kind of reset your mind mm-hmm. and kind of take it slow. So I had pizza with my family. We all had pizza together. Um, and my in laws are, my, husband's family is all from New Orleans and so like their mindset is go big or go home like my father-in-law had ordered pizza for the nurses mm. so the nurses were eating pizza with... <laughs> it was a party in my room um had some pizza um things started intensifying for sure um and just really my plan was to have an unmedicated birth and so I was really like just working through everything as best as I could remember birthing ball shower walking around um and it was great um you know we had told my in-laws and my parents like stay to your comfort if at any point you feel like it's too much and it's going to that energy is going to shift the room I we ask that you leave but if you feel like you can handle everything and stay um in sync with us, please do. Also know I may be naked. So if you can't handle that, then you also should leave. But I'm just going to let this birth take me where it takes me. Um, but they all like were in it. Um, you know, my mom was massaging me at one point. My father-in-law had like was like fanning me during points. Um, they're all like taking turns, kind of providing me the support I needed. Um, and I... Time is like, I don't really remember time, but I know into that next day, um, like things, it was just really starting to get intense. Um, I had asked really for no checks um, unless they, you know, it had been like a while and I, and I can't even, I can't even remember when they did do checks, but I do know there was a point in the labor where like I was starting to lose momentum and like felt myself losing a bit of control and I think it was my water had broke um a little bit before but I was like things are just really intensifying and I need something like Mm -hmm. something to change um so they're like well why don't we try nitrous oxide first so they get that out and I just remember them like all I could remember from the instructions was I was the only one allowed to hold it Mm -hmm. and so (laughs) I was like putting it over my face. And I just remember being like, this is horrible. I don't like this feeling. I don't want this. But I just, I kept telling her like, you need to get rid of it. Like, please get rid of this. And my mother-in-law went to like grab it. I was like, you can't touch it. Like, you're not allowed to touch it. (laughs) Only I'm allowed to touch it, but I want it to go away. And it was like this weird, like I I was having like an out of body experience. They're like, no, Laurel, she can like move it away from you if you want. Um. So we tried the nitrous oxide and I'm like, this is like, it's not taking the edge off. I actually feel like kind of sick. I don't really like this. Um, We've got to do something different. And at this point, um, 
you know, Frankie had been in the bed with me and was kind of like rocking with me. And I just remember like I, I started crying um, and I was like, I think we need to make a call about what's next because I'm suffering. Like this just feels like I'm suffering. And so um, I remember I was like leaning in front of him and he kind of like grabbed my hands and just like we both stared at each other. And, and it was as if he didn't even like tell everybody to be quiet, but I just don't remember like seeing or hearing anyone and kind of just like looking in his eyes and he's like tearing up a little bit. And he's like, at, like we do what you need to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we talked through options and I was like, okay, I think that the epidural and my, I know my midwives had come in too cause they were like, what, like trying to figure out where we should go next. Mm-hmm. And so my midwives came in and I was like, I think I'm ready to, to get some support with the epidural. And they kicked everybody out. And I had um, an amazing, I had amazing nurses except for one lady who I do know like in the thick of it, I know I'm jumping a little bit, but during that point of things being really intense, she said, I don't know why like people want to go unmedicated. Like, why would you do that to yourself? Mm. And she was like talking to my mom. And I remember like making eyes with my mom, like, if you don't get this baby out of this room, (laughs) this is how I want to do this birth. I don't care what anybody else has to say, but she has to go. (laughs) Um, I don't know where she went. I don't, I don't know how they handled that, but I know my mom caught on real quick that Missy had to leave, but everybody else was just really um, phenomenal and really in tune with like we actually had too many people for our room, mm-hmm. but nobody said anything. Like they, I think they realized how important that was for me. Um, so they let all of my my birth team be in the space with us. Um, they were great about listening to me um, about you know really allowing us to make the decisions that felt good. And so I do know when they came in to do the epidural. I was just feeling really frazzled and my nurse just did like a really good job with, of calming me down. I remember the anesthesiologist was like trying to be quick, but he was also just being really harsh about some of the things she was saying. And she just did a really good job of being like, tell her what she needs to know. And then you need to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, and I just appreciated that. Cause you know, trying to hold contraction or trying to hold, you know, through contractions while trying, like trying to get an epidural can be a bit um, difficult. So we got the epidural um, and I fell asleep immediately, like mm-hmm. knocked out. Um, and I remember at one, like before I fell asleep, Frankie had been awake all this time and kind of looked at me and he was like, would it be okay if, if I went to sleep too? <laughs> I was like, yes, um, please, please go get your rest. And so I remember they woke me up and they're like, why don't we do a check to kind of see where you are? And at that point I was complete. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is our, by the way, like my labor that whole time, this was our 35. Mm. I had been in labor for 35 hours with Miss Naomi. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So um, started pushing. I had the mirror. Frankie was on one leg. My mother-in-law was on the other my mom was standing behind the mirror facetiming my sister um (laughs) my dad and my father-in-law are kind of standing off by the the, like where they had the birth station um the baby like stuff and um i don't really remember how many pushes i do know um, naomi did have shoulder dystocia and Mm -hmm. i don't recall any of this but you know everybody else says things did get kind of frantic during my pushing so I will say my midwife and nurse did a great job of not letting me know that there was anything Mm -hmm. um wrong but um after a couple pushes they put that little thing on my chest and I was just like and we didn't know um if we were having a boy or a girl so you know they put her on my chest and then um after a while Frankie was like it's a girl um, and I just started crying. So Aww, that's, lovely. that's how Miss Naomi made her way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story. That's great. Thank you. Danny, how about you? Well, since Laurel shared her beginning, I'll share my end. <laughs> Yin be- and yang, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Better be the end. <laughs> um So I'll share my one and only son's birth. Um, 
that happened a couple years ago. Is he still? Um, let's see, where would I begin with this story? <laughs> I could begin on the weekend right before he was born. So he had been giving me some back pain. Um, so I had to do a lot of position changes and doing my own doula work over the weekend a little bit. And I thought that he was going to come and contractions had gotten really, you know, amped up and then just completely fizzled out. I had had my doulas ready um, <laughs> to go, pumped up. And Laurel was one of those doulas <laughs> since we work for a doula collective. So mm -hmm. we, I had two technically three, <laughs> but two were on call for me that weekend. And um, so he chilled out until Monday. And so my mother and I went walking around like a local mall and just to get him all situated and get him ready as we love to do a good walk as we get closer to our labors. And we probably walked and then like in the morning and like around noon, I started doing just like some basic body work in the bed um, in my room and like cat cowing and sideline with my little peanut ball. And I was texting with my doulas and just letting them know where the contraction pattern was. And my kids are kind of like just all over the house. My daughters, um, my mom, my daughters and my husband, my husband had like went to run errands or something. And I text him like, you might want to come home. <laughs> like not. <laughs> Not later, but <laughs> like now. Um, so I think the contractions are like maybe 10 minutes apart when I told them, you know, things were pump getting amped up. And while I was laying, doing sideline with the peanut ball, like I felt this huge like whoosh, whoosh feeling in my mm. stomach. Like my son like turned perfectly mm. and my water broke. <laughs> and it was like, I was like, okay, well, he's doing a thing. He's working. There's no rush to go to the mm -hmm. hospital. You know, we're, we're still doing a thing here. Um, and around that time, that's when my doula showed up and we're just, we're hanging out in my room, had my music going and kind of going back and forth between like my bed and our bathroom. And it was in the bathroom as most things do go down when you're at home laboring. <laughs> It is dark um, and it is quiet and isolated and I did not want to leave. And that was a struggle <laughs> as, she, yeah. you know, as we got to like, we're like five minutes apart. <laughs> and so my husband had to come in and help me ease my way down and out, um, both her and I, my doula and I. And so this was like in December in Ohio so it's cold mm -hmm. I'm in the throes of labor and on the way to the hospital which was running like 20 minutes away um my husband is like steady trying to call the hospital to let them know to get the tub ready because I was supposed to have a water birth and my dude was like oh he's so sweet <laughs> he thinks he's gonna make it to water <laughs> he's really trying to hit his yeah, mark yes, off yes. Of he had a job <laughs> let him do his job he had, job, he had a job on the birth plan. It was in red, the things he needed to do, his part. And he was trying to make it happen. Meanwhile, I'm in the back seat, rolling the window down with my whole head out because I was so hot. <laughs> I'm in the car on my hands and knees, basically. And my mother's in her car with my other kids. And we arrive at the hospital and I cannot sit in the wheelchair so I am on my knees in the wheelchair face backwards and my doula is pushing me through the hospital <laughs> and my husband's trying to ballet and doing all those things um and so we get up to the maternity ward and they want me to they want to check my registration my doula's like she's pre-registered and we also don't have time for that um, and then so we go to triage and the nurse is like, well, I need to do a cervical check. And <laughs> my doula is like, there's hair and she's crowning. Um, so we're not going to do a cervical check. So I literally like crawl from one bed to the next one for them to wheel me down to the delivery room. And I crawl onto that bed and the midwives and the nursing staff are just sitting there watching me and I'm there hands and knees on the bed 
and gently push my son out with, I think, one instruction of just to slow down. And it was peaceful and quiet because no one had to tell them to be quiet. It was just, it's already happening and you don't have to do anything Mm -hmm. but watch and make sure everybody's safe. And it was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing, both of you. You're welcome. Lovely stories. Thanks so much. Thank you for being on my podcast. I was You're really welcome. excited to have the both of you here. Um, this has been great. Let people know where they can find you. Yes. Yes. We are at birthstoriesincolor.com. Also on Instagram and Facebook as Birth Stories in Color. And on everywhere you can find your podcast, Apple, Stitcher, what else, Laurel? Spotify. Spotify, Spotify. all the other random ones that exist. Wonderful. (laughs) Thank you so much for taking this time. I really appreciate having the both of you on. I'm glad this worked out. I'm beyond thrilled. I can't wait. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just wait one second while I will.